A man is on bended knee. He lets his mind wander as he prays. He is a knight of the Knights Templar and has sworn an oath to protect the Holy Land and his adopted city of Jerusalem. He was born in France, but after years of travel and warfare, he has made the Temple Mount his home. In the distance, he can hear pilgrims pouring into the city from his homeland. He knows that they will be exhausted, but happy to see the sights. A smile creeps across his face as he feels content with all the work that he has done. Trade is thriving in the city. People are free to travel. But in the back of his mind, he knows that paradise won't last forever. Even though Christendom is unrivaled in Europe, he knows all too well that he is not in Europe and the grip of the Islamic Caliphate is tightening around the Holy Land. Hello and welcome to the channel I am the Knight of History and it is a pleasure to have you here with us today. This is part number three of the Crusader story. And in this week, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in part number two, where we spoke about the first crusade. Now, that is a dead giveaway. I said the first crusade, which clearly means that there were more than one. In fact, there were eight. But in this series, we're only going to go up to the fourth crusade. Today, however, we are going to focus on the second and the third crusade. Before we start off, though, if you prefer podcasts, I've made a podcast channel called Night of History that is just an audio version of these videos. So wherever you get your podcasts, you know what to do. Please like, comment and subscribe. Now let's get into this. Throughout their progress through the Holy Land, the Crusaders established their own network of crusader states which were ruled by European knights. The knight Godfrey of Bouillon became the de facto ruler of Jerusalem after he helped conquer it with the crusaders. Even though he was a brutally violent man and the leaders of the crusades had been vying for the position of head crusader, Godfrey of Bouillon seemed to be the head crusader. But he refused to be crowned as the king of Jerusalem. But when he died a year later in 1100, that's 1100, his brother, who was a rather power hungry man, wanted to step out of the shadow of his brother. And he gathered up enough support to have himself crowned as King Baldwin I of Jerusalem. The Italian knight that we spoke about in the last episode, called Bermond of Toronto, became the Prince of Antioch after the Crusaders had promised that they would give back this city to the Byzantines. But clearly that did not happen, seeming that they needed to have a prince as a ruler. This is where we see the real face of the Crusaders coming to light, as they were power-hungry men seeking to raise their positions in life. For example, Bolton I's cousin became the Count of Edessa. Other important coastal towns such as Tripoli and Acre were captured by the Crusaders to ensure that they would have a steady supply of reinforcements coming into the Holy Land and secure the pilgrim sea routes from Europe. This meant that the Crusades became wealthy the actual people built these vast castles, established control over their new territories, such as the enormous castle of Crac de Chevalier in Syria. But why was this team of criminals, let's say, this power hungry men who were ill-equipped and undersupplied so successful? The fact is that the First Crusade had been helped out by the Islams because there was in-house fighting in the Islamic Caliphates. The Shia and the Sunni branch did not get along. See part number one of the series to understand the Islamic world a bit better. But all of this was about to change. 
during the 1100s, the Islams actually pulled themselves towards themselves and had a response to the Holy War of the Crusades. Remember, they also wanted Jerusalem. For them, it was the all-important city of the Dome of the Rock, where Muhammad, their prophet, ascended into heaven. Therefore, the Islams launched their own holy war, and they called it the Jihad. This holy war, the Jihad for the Islams, was really the start of the Second Crusade. By 1144, the Muslim forces had captured the northernmost Crusader states. Edessa was captured. In response to this, the Pope Eugenius III called the kings of Europe for a Second Crusade. This time, two kings, Louis VII of France and Conrad II of Germany, took up the cross with an enormous crusader force of 50,000. However, there was quite a bit of confusion, just like the first crusade. By the time that they eventually arrived in the Holy Land in July 1148, they were kind of this ragtag team. And instead of taking back the crusader city that they had lost, Edessa, in the northernmost region of the Holy Land, they decided to take a much wealthier city, Damascus. This massive force arrived, but the siege only lasted three days before the Crusaders' army ran out of food. No one had direct orders, and it was a mess, which meant that they were repulsed by the Islams, and simply, they left back to Europe, empty-handed. And in actual fact, they were humiliated. The Second Crusade was a failure. For the next few years, though, the Islamic world grew stronger and stronger. There was a young man raising through the military ranks of Egypt, even though he was born in Iraq. Eventually, this young man became the head of the Egyptian army, and then he became the Sultan. He had an idea. He wanted to unite the Islamic world under one banner. This man, Yosef ibn Ayyub ibn Shaidi, or better known as Saladin, united most of the Muslim forces around the world when he united the Egyptian and the Syrian areas. He was a military genius and extraordinarily respectful of chivalric virtues. This man, Saladin, is extraordinarily well known even today, and it is because of a very good reason. His army became seriously powerful. And eventually, in 1187, along with his army, he met a massive crusader force between two extinct volcanoes on the plains of Hattin in the Holy Land, where he absolutely demolished the crusader forces, executing a number of prisoners and knights because he knew of their military might. He didn't stop there, though. He went on to take the city of Jerusalem itself. And instead of killing everyone like the Crusaders had done years before, he was merciful. He let people leave. By 1189, two years after the battle, he had taken over 50 Crusader strongholds, including the port city of Acre. I've done an episode on him back when I was talking about the Knights Templar in part number four, The Downfall, if you want to learn about that in depth. Anyway, the Holy Land was now in Muslim hands. This news of the fall of Jerusalem to Muslim hands really shocked the European world and Christendom. People were taken back by it, and a third crusade was called for, not by the Pope, but by the kings of Christendom. These leaders included the likes of King Richard I of England, better known as Richard the Lionheart, the all-conquering King Frederick of Germany, who was also the Holy Roman Emperor, better known as Barbarossa, which is an Italian word which means red beard. He got it from conquering all the Italian states, pretty much. And finally, there was King Philip II of France. This party of kings set out in 1191 from Europe to get to the Holy Land. But on the way there, Barbarossa, the Holy Roman Emperor, and the German King Frederick died. How did he die? Well, he was crossing a river in Anatolia where he fell from his horse. Apparently, his very large, weighty armor drowned him because he couldn't get up. 
because he was pushed down by the weight. King Richard the Lionheart conquered the island of Cyprus on the way there, just below Greece, of course, where he then sold this island to the illustrious order of the Knights Templar. Also, while he was there, he freed his sister, who was imprisoned by the Byzantine ruler there. By June 1191, the Crusader army had arrived. They were a diverse group of people, and they met up with the survivors of the Battle of the Hattin, where they went to siege the city of Akka with the king of Jerusalem, a person called Guy. Under the leadership of Richard the Lionheart, the Crusader force managed to get Saladin to surrender this enormous city of Akka, very important city, on the 12th of July, 1191. In a big part of the peace negotiations, the merciful Saladin promised to return Christian relics believed to be part of the Cross of Christ, which had been captured during the Battle of Atin. But Saladin took his time before signing the agreement. So Richard the Lionheart marched 2,600 prisoners of war and in full sight of Saladin and his army, he executed them. This forced Saladin to sign the agreement quickly. Having won the siege of Acre, Richard the Lionheart took full control of the Crusader force. This massive force marched their way to Jerusalem, thinking they would take the city. But we must think here. These were Europeans in the Crusades, and they were so far from home. They had to travel great distances just to get to the Holy Land, never mind fight in it. This was a massive desert area and they weren't used to being there. They couldn't find food, they couldn't find water and they were slowly running out of supplies and dying from illnesses. By January 1192, just 12 miles out of Jerusalem, Richard the Lionheart became ill and he decided to turn his weak army back to the city of Acre. By the summer of 1192, after years of fighting. The two people, Richard and Saladin, called for a truce after the Battle of Jaffa, after a resounding crusader victory. The Muslims still held Jerusalem, however, but the crusaders held the stronghold of Acre, and they were given permission by the Muslims to go on pilgrim to visit the city of Jerusalem. But this is where we see two fierce rivals, Richard and Saladin, become extraordinarily respectful to one another. For example, during the Battle of Jaffa, Saladin had heard that Richard's horse had been killed beneath him. Instead of pushing his forces forward to kill his opposition, he sent Richard a new horse. Then, of course, there was Richard who was falling ill in the late summer of that year and on his deathbed, so Saladin sent him his personal doctors with peaches and sherbet cooled from the snow from nearby mountains to help him recover. These are just a few things that Saladin did, but it earned him the title of merciful. On his pilgrim to Mecca in 1193 to celebrate the end of the Third Crusade, he actually ended up dying from fever at the age of 55. He was a man whose greatness and mercy has stood the test of time. Please let me know if you want a actual video on him in the future. But please join me for the next episode where we talk about the life of a crusader knight. It doesn't end here. I really hope that you enjoyed that. Please like, comment and subscribe the more you know. Yeah.